Today we are going to talk about forgiveness. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> we're going to finish up this the series, uh, the series uh, that we've been on for a couple weeks now. Uh, so we in, in the first week we looked at Noah and we looked at the way that he was able to uh, condemn the world. He was a preacher of righteousness who never once said a word, uh, and how we in in turn we preach to the world by our obedience. It's not going to be our rants and ravings that's going to save people. It's going to be our obedience to God. Uh, when we stand ourselves as, as separate from the culture, that's, that's going to be a big thing. We looked at, uh, the week after that, we looked at so- uh, Lot as Sodom and Gomorrah was being destroyed. Uh, something that's really gone down in history, and it's even, terms used nowadays still refer back to uh, the event at Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, and we looked at the way that we make a difference by our service. It's not by taking control. If we could just fix the society, no, <laughs> that's not going to be what makes a difference. It's going to be the way we serve our culture. Uh, and we looked at last week, we looked at the idea of how bad attitudes inevitably <laughs> lead to bad choices. When we have bad attitudes towards the world, you can't love people and serve them if you don't, don't love them. <laughs> and it's hard to love people when you so vehemently disagree with them. We looked at all this last week. And uh, so if you want revenge, what do you do? You, get, you forgive. It puts it in God's hands. It moves us forward. Now, throughout these stories that we've been looking at, uh, I'm sure you've noticed a theme, and that's as we go more and more into the future, we see throughout these stories that God's people slowly are becoming more and more like their culture. They're becoming less and less distinct. Uh, by the end of Genesis, you're stuck with God's people. A lot of God's people are looking a whole lot like the people that they're going to you know, uh, take their land from. So the things are kind of not looking great for them. There's this slow decline from Abraham who says, no, don't intermarry until today we are going to look at somebody who did uh, intermarry and what that means. Um, so, you know, with last week, we looked at the tragedy of Dinah, and it was a very near miss. Uh, they came this close to became, becoming Canaanites, this close to becoming like the culture. And so let's kind of move the story forward. This is the last of the, of the, of the four parts we're going to look at. And the main point I want you to get from today <clears throat> is that we win by not giving up. That's, that's how we win as Christians. There's going to be a lot of things that's happening. Revelation tells us about it. Matthew tells us about it. We're in the last days. Okay, all these things are going to not be great. <laughs> but we are going to win by not giving up. In fact, in the, in the songs this morning, uh, Melissa sang one song that said, We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Not giving up. That idea of keeping on so uh with that we're going to look uh, the story we're going to look at is this guy uh judah who's one of israel's sons and the wife that he marries um so let's kind of do some setup and i've taken out a lot of different parts of the passages because they were really long and i didn't want to spend you know 150 slides so let's plow through here leah's daughter dinah whom leah bore to jacob went out to see some of the young women of the area this is from genesis 34 when Shechem, son of Hamor the Hivite, who was the region's chieftain, saw her, he took her and uh, mistreated her. God said to Jacob, get up, go to Bethel and settle there. So we, you see, this is we looked at this last week, so I'm just trying to skim here. The event at Shechem, they moved to Bethel in chapter 35, and then we get down to chapter 37, and this is what we read this morning uh, at the beginning of the service, but let's kind of see how this fits together in chapter 37. At 17 years of age, Joseph, who's one of uh, Israel's sons, uh, tended sheep with his brothers. He brought a bad report about them to their father. Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons. So you got to imagine, as if, as if he's already not the younger brother. You guys have younger brothers, right? And sometimes they irritate you in ways that only a younger sibling can. <laughs> so he, all, already things are not going well. But then their father has multiple wives and multiple children from the multiple wives, and they're all living together. So you can imagine already it's very tense. In that household, <laughs> uh, Thanksgiving must have been a bit of a nightmare. Uh, let, let's just say they had multiple kids' tables, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> uh, and uh, so then you you see he he's put over his his older brothers, which I'm sure they loved, <laughs> and then he brings a bad report about them, which once again I'm sure everybody loved that, and uh, Israel loved Joseph more than his other sons. The icing on the cake. Uh, so let's keep moving forward. When his brothers saw they hated him, when they saw that, his, that their father loved Joseph more than them, they hated him. Uh, then Joseph had a dream. When he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. 
he told his father and brothers, and his father rebuked him. And I'm skipping a lot of verses. I highly encourage you to go back and read the whole event. But the problem is that oftentimes when people talk about the Old Testament, they'll look at one story. But usually, if there's a story in the Old Testament, you've got like 10 or 12 chapters that are connected. And you look at this one story, and you have no idea what's actually going on because you're not paying attention to the overarching story. So I'm trying to give you an overarching story, but that's going to take a lot of time, so I had to cut a lot of it out. So, okay. And going on from, from there to verse 13. Israel said to Joseph, Your brothers are pasturing the flocks. I'm sending you to them. They saw him in the distance and plotted to kill him. When Reuben heard this, he tried to save him. Don't shed blood. Throw him into his pit, intending to rescue him and return him to his father. So you've got to understand what's happening here. Reuben is the oldest. But he did something that was very, very bad with his, one of his father's um, concubines. So that very embarrassing incident, cost him his inheritance. And he lost his inheritance as a firstborn. So then it went on to Simeon, who is the secondborn. But Simeon lost it in the event we read about last week, where him and Levi went and slaughtered an entire town. And so he lost his inheritance. So then it went to the fourthborn, who is Judah. The same Judah that Jesus came from. And that's why Jesus came through the line of Judah, and why Judah was the tribe of the kings was because they were the inheritor of the title. Now, it wasn't all bad for Levi, though, because eventually he kind of turned a corner, and his tribe did some good things in the book of Exodus or Numbers. I think it was Numbers. And they became the tribe of priests. So they partially regained an inheritance. They didn't get a piece of land, but they were throughout the land. So that was good. But Reuben here is trying to do a little bit of a, <laughs> I don't know if you call it a power play, but he's trying to, yeah, let's, let's, let's throw him into this pit instead of kill him. That's a good idea, you know, so he can come back, get Joseph back, and get the favor because he knows that Joseph is the, is the favorite. <laughs> so if he does, you know, hey, huzzah, I, I've got my one up again. I can get my inheritance back. So th that's kind of important for what happens, ne happens next. Judah said to his brothers, let's sell him. And his brothers agreed. They took Joseph's robe. Dipped, it, dipped the robe in its blood. They sent the robe to their father and said, We found this. Examine it. Is your son's robe or not? His father recognized it. Then Jacob tore his clothes, put sackcloth around his waist, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters tried to comfort him, but he refused. I will go to the grave to my son mourning. And one thing you see, and I cut it out of this, this excerpt, but one thing that you see is when, when Reuben finds out that uh, that they sold Joseph. and said, Well, I'll, I'll read this next verse too. And his father wept for him. Uh, just because it's so short, I don't want to just... <laughs> that's going to be an awkward spot to stop on. Uh, when Reuben finds out that Judah sold Joseph instead of keeping him in the pit like they discussed, because Reuben had gone away when, when Judah came up with this idea, um, he gets really upset and he tears his clothes because he lost his opportunity. Um, so this event, parts of it um, are happening... Um, at the same time as the event we read last week with Dinah, and some of it happens afterwards. So you just kind of have to keep in mind that this part of Genesis isn't in chronological order. Okay? Uh, we know that because uh, Judah's sons grow up and marry, but by the end of the book there's just not enough time for that to fit in. So I'm just kind of clarifying that. If you read this story and you think, hold on, there's a contradiction. There's not. There's not. It's just it's not in chronological order. So uh, moving on from there, uh, we get to chapter 38. And this is the story that we're actually looking at. Now that we've done all this, all this build-up, okay? So we, Dinah was mistreated. They lost their inheritance. Uh, jo Joseph is sold into slavery. Now we get to the story. This is, it's important to know that so you can understand this. Judah left his brothers. Judah saw a Canaanite named Shua. He took her as a wife. She gave birth to Ur, Onan, and Shelah. This was at Kesib. Judah got a wife for her. her I'm sorry, for Ur. <laughs> her name was Tamar. Ur was evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord put him to death. Judah said to Onan, Perform your duty as her brother-in-law and produce offspring for your brother. Onan knew that the offspring would not be his, so he released his seed, and I'll let you figure out what that is, on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. What he did was evil in the Lord's sight, so he put him to death also. Judah said to Tamar, Remain a widow in your father's house until Shela grows up, for he thought he might die too. Judah's wife died. Then Judah had finished mourning. I'm sorry, when Judah had finished mourning, he went up to Timnah. Tamar was told, 
So she took off her widow's clothes, veiled her face, and, and sat at Enam on the way to Timnah. She saw that though Shelah had grown up, she had not become his wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute. He went to her and said, come, let me know you. And I'm, I'm changed a lot of words so that way younger audiences might not, you know, get the full idea here. He did not know what she, that she was Tamar. She said, what will you give me? A young goat. She said, only if you leave something with me. What? He asked. And she answered, your signet ring, your cord, and the staff in your hand. She became pregnant, and when Judas sent the young goat, he could not find her. He asked, where is the cult prostitute? There has been no cult prostitute here, they answered. And remember, we would all agree that prostitution is bad, but this is a step beyond that. This is a cult prostitute. So this is, you can see the way that Judah is basically a Canaanite. He's, he's not really God's people. He's more of his people. <laughs> he's selling his brother, having relations with, with cultic activities. You know, all these different things that are just not great. He had said very specifically he married a Canaanite. This is not, he's not thinking very far about God's promises to the people. Um, so, um, have you guys noticed how X-rated sometimes the Bible is? <laughs> it's got seances and, and, and people getting murdered and sexual things. And it's like, <laughs> I'm just glad that in kids' Bibles, you know, they make things a lot more G. And when they, especially the, the graphic novel versions, they, they take out a lot of stuff. This would be very uncomfortable very fast. You know, I'm thinking Game of Thrones. And, uh, well, anyways... Where is a cult prostitute? There has been no cult prostitute here, they answered. Judah replied, let her keep the items. Otherwise, we will become a laughing stock. I did send this goat, but couldn't find her. Ugh, that's awkward. Three months later, Judah was told, Tamar has been acting like a prostitute, and now she is pregnant. Bring her out, Judah said, and let her be burned to death. Huzzah, finally a solution to our problem. My son doesn't have to marry her. Yes. As she was being brought out, she sent Judah this message. I am pregnant by the man these items belong. And she added, examine them. Whose signet ring cord and staff are these? Judah recognized them and said, Ooh, she is more on the right than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not know her intimately again. When the time came to give birth, there were twins. One of them put out his hand, and the midwife took it and tied a scarlet thread around it. But then he pulled his hand back. Out came his brother. She said, What a breakout you have made for yourself. So he was named Perez. Then, now, Perez, uh, if you read the book of Ruth and whatnot, you find out that Perez is also the father of Jesus. Grand, grandfather, obviously, not direct, because <laughs> that's a long time to be, be in labor. Uh, then, his, <laughs> then his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied to his hand, came out and was named Zira. So even though the older brother uh, was older, the blessing went to the younger. And this is a story, a very odd story, about the older being subjugated to the younger, and just kind of awkward. And, and it seems a lot of times when you're reading in the Bible, it just seems like something's out of place. And the thing about out-of-place stories in the Bible is when something in the Bible is out of place, pay all the more attention. Pay very careful attention. We're talking about Joseph. And then out of nowhere, we've got Judah's odd family account. And then at the end of that, we have a weird labor story. And then it goes back to Joseph. And you're thinking, what is going on? Well, when that kind of stuff, and, you, and you're reading the Bible, and something's just totally off the wall, pay closer attention. It's oftentimes even more attention, more important. So let's look at Judah as a person. He's, he's intermarrying with, with the people of the land. The, the, the basic modern-day equivalent of that would be uh, Christians marrying non-Christians. Uh, it's not about an ethnic thing. <laughs> it's not about anything like that. Uh, it's basically God's people uh, getting in relationships with people they shouldn't be. And this is something we still do today, right? I'm a Christian, but I think I can... I think I can I think I can win this person to the Lord. We're going to date, and I think it'll be okay, and most of the time it doesn't. <laughs> Especially when we're in high school and we say this, we say, I can, I can, I can get this person, and uh, never mind the fact that the grand majority of 90-something percent of high school relationships fall apart. And then, not only that, but most of the time that you go to w witness date people, you end up going out of church, not them into church. Statistically, I'm not saying it can't happen, but more or less it almost always does that. And uh, so you have this, this Judah intermarrying, and he wasn't trying to witness to her. <laughs> he, was, he was just doing what, what guys oftentimes do, not thinking. And uh, so he, he intermarries and uh, gets with somebody who really has no, no, no interest. Now remember, earlier in Genesis, his grandfather made it very, very clear, do not intermarry with the people of the land. That happened some 20 years ago. 
And so now, I'm sorry, 20 chapters ago. And so now you're getting later and you're, you're realizing that the story is connected. <laughs> it's in one book for a reason. It's, it's a connected story. And uh, it mentions that, that the place that, that Judah, he marries this, this woman, Shua, and they have kids. The place that they marry, it says it's Chesed. Now, this is a little bit of a, a funny thing going on here because what that word means in Hebrew is it means deceit or lying. So they have Judah is leading his brothers in lying to his father. And then he lies to Tamar. <laughs> and just the whole situation there, Tamar, you know, and that whole situation, there's a lot of deceit going on. And you'll remember that Jacob is kind of the, the father of deceit with how much he lies. Um, and so it says it was at Keseb that she gave birth. And uh, it, it's kind of, I guess you'd call that a dramatic irony, I guess. Um, you know, he lied to his father, lied to Tamar. And uh, one thing that you see whenever people read this story is they, they, they sometimes lose the forest for the trees. And they think that the story has something to do with childbirth. Uh, I'm sorry, not childbirth, birth control. And the thing, <laughs> the thing about that is that this story has nothing to do with birth control. It wasn't an issue of preventing pregnancy, generally speaking. Okay? It's an issue that Onan's problem was spite. He was doing it specifically to spite his brother. If you, if you look, it actually clarifies itself. In verse 9 it says, Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. He was helping his brother's line to continue. He knew it wouldn't be his, which mean, it would mean that he would also have some of the financial burden. <laughs> so in order to save himself the irritation of that, he decided I'll get all the perks without any of the uh, payment. Um, so basically, you think of free prostitution, I guess. So whenever he slept with his brother's wife, he released on the ground so that he would not produce offspring for his brother. The issue here is spite, not birth control. Not birth control at all. And that's important uh, because it says that it was very evil and that God killed him for it. Uh, and so it's uh, important to remember here, that it, it, in modern days, it would be basically, uh, it would be equivalent to trying to kill off your brother's kids. Uh, trying to steal from him after he's passed. Let's say your brother goes off to war and dies as a veteran, and you steal all, all of his belongings. It would be kind of equivalent to that. Um, we don't really have a modern-day thing that happens because we don't really do the whole family lines like that, but I'm sure you'll kind of get what I'm saying anyways. Now, uh, in, uh, in, in, in part of the story, if you were paying attention, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you noticed it, but you have a repetition from what happens with Jacob... And what happens with Joseph? So let's look at this. I'm sorry, with Judah. So in 38.25, he says this. Examine them. This is Tamar speaking to her father-in-law. Examine them. Whose signet ring, cord, and staff are these? Um, I'm sorry. Did I miss those, those two up? No, I, I didn't. I just put the paragraph space in the awkward place. So it, pretend like this line here in the middle is one line higher. And we're just going to use our imaginations, okay? You guys have seen SpongeBob, right? We're going to use our imaginations. Uh, so that is the first story, and that's when Tamar is sending these things to, uh, to Judah. Well, then, if you go backwards to the story that we read very briefly in chapter 37, this is what they said to Jacob. They sent the robe and said, we found this. Examine it. Is it your son's robe or not? Do you see the similarity in the way that it's said? That, that's on purpose. Hebrew does this quite... He, yeah, Hebrew... Hebrew... Hebrews? The Hebrew language <laughs> does this quite a bit, uh, where, especially in storytelling, well, they'll, they'll do kind of this interplay between the two, and they'll be contrasting these two stories. So you see that these stories, it's not that they have nothing to do in common. They actually have a lot to do in common. They both revolve around deceit and showing somebody something as a sign somehow involved with the deceit. In the case of Tamar, it's, I deceived you into, into carrying on my husband's line. So, I mean, she did have good intentions. It's just very awkward that she did it that way. And, uh, you know, obviously very sinful too. Uh, but um, then you have, on the other story, you have them trying to lie to the father to keep it from him. So you, you got a little bit, uh, obviously, an interplay there, but, but still very, very different. Now, the, to us nowadays, we think, how awkward. I mean... <laughs> I'm sure we all have stories of our in-laws. Maybe we don't like them too much, and these things happen, right? Uh, I'm sure we can't even imagine us doing this kind of thing. But there actually is, if you can believe it, there's, there's a Hittite law that 
existed at this time, that instructed barren widows to marry their father-in-law. Now, all of you can take a collective sigh of relief. Oh, we, don't t- we don't follow that law anymore. But so Tamar isn't off the wall with this. She is following the law of the time. This was before Moses' law was given. She is following the law of the time. She just took it too far. Because you're supposed to marry them, not trick them into, you know, relationships and stuff. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I, I, I guess once again, that's going to be another Thanksgiving story that uh, doesn't age very well for them. And uh, so, so, uh, so with her action here, she is able to preserve her husband's line, which is obviously very important. I, if I remember correctly, I, once again, don't... Don't take this one to the bank. But if I remember correctly, um, by her doing this, she also becomes part of Jesus' line. If I remember correctly, I'm not positive about that one. I'm positive about Perez and all that. Um, wait, no, so that would be, yes. Okay, yes. So this is through, because she did that, the line was preserved and Jesus was born through that same line. See, there's, these, are, these are very important, uh, very important things. Uh, and you see this a lot in Genesis, people doing wrong things and something good coming from it. Like where they slaughtered the whole town last week, and there's, that's bad, and yet something good came from it. Um, and in, G- in Genesis, if you think the Bible is full of flat characters, you're not really reading it close enough, because it's got a lot of people doing good and bad things. I mean, Judges by itself has a lot of this. Uh, so uh, you see this, and it happens right in between the account of what's going on with Joseph, and it seems like it's out of place, but the thing is, you see that Judah is being contrasted with Joseph because Judah is now the inheritor of the firstborn, okay, and Joseph is not. And when we look at that story, we see that it ends as if you didn't get the message that it was a contrast between Judah and Joseph. It ends on the, on the account of Perez being born. It seems like it's off the, off the wall, but it's not. And the idea is that the younger conquered the o- older, just like Joseph was going to conquer Judah. And I'll explain what that means in just a minute. But Genesis 38 says, One of them put out his hand, but then he pulled his hand back. Out came his brother, so he was named Perez. Then his brother, who had the scarlet thread tied to his hand, came out and was named Zerah. So we see that the two are contrasted. And if you look over the story, and I'm just going to once again flip this very quickly, just to give you an idea of who Joseph is, we, we just saw who Judah is, <laughs> and it was, it, was, it was ugly. <laughs> that was nasty. Then we get to cha- Genesis 39, the next chapter, and we see who Joseph is. The Lord was with Joseph, doesn't say that about Judah. He became a successful man, doesn't say that about Judah. His master saw that the Lord was with him and made everything he did successful. Joseph became his personal attendant, put him in charge of his household, placed all he owned under his authority. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's household because of Joseph. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. His wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, Know me. I love, I love how, how it, it... Pay attention to the words that stories use. Because of all the words that he could have used, he used longingly. <laughs> The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house because of Joseph. He did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. His wife looked longingly at Joseph and said, Know me. And once again, they'll let you figure out what that means. Although she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to know her. This is a fantastic mark of character. Literally someone throwing himself, herself at you with, Hey, no repercussions. I'm not going to get caught. Which, by the way, you always get caught. I, I, people always think that they're not going to get caught. They always do. Uh, but, I mean, hey, zero repercussions. Nobody's going to be the victim. This is great. Uh, maybe he doesn't appreciate her anyways. You know, maybe he, you know, huzzah, I've got, I've got, I've got a, a reason for doing this. And, uh, and instead, he does what's right. That's just an amazing sign of character. Um, the master's wife told him, these are the things your slave did to me. He was furious and had Joseph thrown into prison. So he didn't do anything wrong, and then he got blamed for doing something wrong. Uh, but the Lord was with Joseph. He granted him favor with the prison warden. The warden did not bother with anything under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. We see the exact same repetition from the story we just finished again here. Joseph is constantly setting himself aside. Now the king of Egypt cut bearer and baker. The king of Egypt's cut bearer and baker who were confined in the prison each had a dream. 
Um, and then Joseph explains the dream to them. He interprets it for them. And then it hops to the end of the story and says, yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. So obviously you can see there's a lot happening in the story. And you have Joseph who's wrongfully imprisoned but still makes the best out of it. God still blesses him. Other prisoners come, into the, come in. He blesses them too. And then he, the cupbearer is released and does not remember what Joseph did for him. Moving on in chapter 41. Then Pharaoh sent for Joseph, I have had a dream, and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said you can bear a dream, I'm sorry, uh, hear a dream and interpret it. I am not able to, Joseph answered. It is God who will give an answer. So you see a lot of Joseph's character, and you see what I mean? We're in chapter 41, and we started in chapter 34. But you see how many themes are connected through those chapters. Don't make the mistake of thinking just because you're going to read one chapter of the Bible a day that that means you should ignore everything before or after. Okay? Pay attention because it is an overarching story. And so we can see a lot of things that contrast Joseph and Judah. And I really am sorry about the size that's going to be on the screen. Uh, I couldn't make it any bigger without making it multiple PowerPoints. And I didn't think about that until just now. Uh, I'm not a big planner, I guess. Uh, so we see Joseph, he was separate from the culture. He wasn't... He wasn't doing the things that the Canaanites were doing. He rose above. Uh, Judah, on the other hand, he was intermarrying. Obviously, he wasn't too concerned about, the, about preserving uh, what, what Abraham was promised. Uh, Joseph uh, passed opportunities to sin. He has constant opportunity to sin, and yet he passes them all up. Judah, on the other hand, accidentally sins. He's so, he's so involved in the culture and doing the things that the culture does that he's going into sin on accident. Joseph was a blessing to others. Judah served himself. You know, it goes on and on about how Joseph was a blessing to this person, a blessing to this person, saved the nation of Egypt. And then Judah, on the other hand, he's over here having an incestual, incestuous affair. Things are not going good over there. Complete contrast between the two. Uh, Joseph is a man who, in, who endures pain. Things are not going well, and he still sticks with it. Judah, on the other hand... Uh, threw away every bringer of pain that came his way. If it was unpleasant, whoosh, let's get rid of it. I don't like this girl. I don't want him to marry and to marry uh, my 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 son. So let's try and get rid of her as fast as possible. Uh, J- Joseph become, becomes two tribes later on, and Judah becomes a very small kingdom. So let me kind of explain that last point. So eventually, these people go to Canaan and they make their own nation, the nation of Israel. That nation doesn't last very long. It splits into two, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Now, the south was, uh, the southern kingdom was a very small kingdom, and it was called, collectively, Judah. Well, the northern nation was much larger. It had ten tribes in it, and it was called, collectively, Ephraim. Sometimes it was called Jacob. Uh, sometimes it was called Israel. But why that's significant is because Joseph, while he's in Egypt, has two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And if you noticed, did you ever notice that there was no tribe of Joseph? You ever notice that? Why? Well, because there's two tribes of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. See, Joseph got the double blessing, and Genesis is telling us why. Why did Joseph get the blessing when Judah was inheritor? This is, this is why. This is what it's explaining. And the stories are contrasted between the two of them to show you why Joseph becomes double blessing and Judah becomes a small nation. This is exactly why. And uh, so you have, um, let's see. Um, so Joseph is, is, is truthful, he's trustworthy, he's honest, he's a hard worker. Uh, he's, a, he's a hard worker as a servant, he's a hard worker in prison, he's a hard worker for Pharaoh. He just has this character that's really above and beyond. And uh, you, you see Joseph constantly enduring pain. He stays separate from the culture even though it's not pleasant for him. And uh, he passes opportunity to sin. He's a blessing. And he be- I already said how he became two tribes. Um, and uh, eventually, on down the line, you get to the prophetic books, and you see the northern kingdom c- called, I think it's by Habakkuk or Hosea. I always get the two names confused. I think it's Hosea. Calls the north kingdom collectively Ephraim. He calls them by that name instead of calling them Jacob or Israel. And the, and the message is obviously clear. The blessing that came to Joseph Slime because he did stay uh, faithful to what God saw was important. And uh, we're getting ready to close up here, but l- let's kind of, I'll just give you a real quick highlight about what happens. Eventually, his brothers come to Egypt, where he is, and he's been appointed, you know, the right under Pharaoh. 
eventually his brothers come and because they need food and there's a huge famine. It's the only place he can get food. And they don't know that it's him, but he instantly recognizes them, uh, probably because he was uh, still in that awkward phase, you know, where you're not really a ki- kid, but you're kind of a man. You know what I mean? Where you got the baby face and you know what I mean? And so now he's, 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 you know, got the man face and he probably has makeup on because he's Egyptian uh, and dressed up in these, you know, excellent robes. And they're probably keeping their heads like this because he's a, a leader. So they don't really recognize the guy. He knows them, though. He's like, oh, you guys look the same. You haven't aged a day. Boy, have I been waiting. No, he doesn't do that. But, uh, you know, and so they have this meeting and he decides to stage kind of a coup, I guess you could say, a a poor word choice, but he kidnaps his brother, Benjamin, and the brothers have to go back without Benjamin. Now, Benjamin hasn't really entered the story too much that we read, but he's the youngest, and he's the last son of Jacob's favorite wife, because remember, he had a bunch of them. They were popping out of the woodwork, and one of them evidently was his favorite, and this was the last one that was born from that favorite before she died. So this is a very special son to him, and uh, Joseph... Uh, is obviously his full blood and full blood brother, and so he kidnaps him uh, to kind of pull a, I guess, a, a mean joke on his brothers. And the idea is that he's testing their character. Have they changed? And this is important because yes, tr- tr- trust has to be earned. It, sh- it should be earned by people who are your pastor. It should be earned, earned by people who are your board. It should be earned by people who you have at your table. Trust should be earned. You shouldn't just, you know, go into business with somebody you're not. <laughs> You know, there, there, should be, there should be some earning of trust there. So uh, he is testing them. And uh, what happens at the end of the story is a bit of a curveball. Judah, the same Judah who sold Joseph, the same Judah who lied to Jacob, the same Judah who had that incident with Tamar, <laughs> the same, that same guy, um, he now has turned a massive corner. And this is what he says. If I come to your servant, my father, and the boy, Benjamin, is not with us, his life is wrapped up with the boy's life when he sees He will die. Instead, take me in his place. He's not gonna he's not gonna miss me. But he's gonna miss him. You see, Jordan and Judah now all of a sudden cares about his father. He was the instigator to Jacob being torn down. And now he is the single one who says, We can't do this to dad again. Not again. This is a we, we can't do this. This is a very evil thing. Just take me in his place. You'll still have somebody here as leverage, but please let him go. And you see a complete change of heart in Judah. And, in, and, in, and this is a very important thing because ultimately it's a story of uh, reconciliation. And, and with that, Judah proves his character. Joseph reveals himself. The family's reunited. And the end of the Genesis ends like this. We, we've read all through Genesis. We constantly see God turning evil things to good. And then we get to the end of the book of Genesis, and his brothers say this. His, their, Jacob finally dies, and the brothers say this. They say, how do we know that Joseph isn't going to kill us now that, Jake, now that our father's dead? How, how, how do we know? Like, what, what guarantee do we have? So they, they, they start kind of freaking out. And then Joseph says this. He says, the thing that you intended for evil, God turned for good. And then the book ends. Joseph dies, and the book ends. The entire Genesis summarized is that the things that men mean for evil, God turns for good. We see it at the Tower of Babel. We see it at Sodom and Gomorrah. We see it at the Flood. We see it all throughout the book of Genesis, people doing bad things and God turning it for good. And so then, okay, so that's great. You've got these people, all this stuff that happens. We looked at a bunch of, bunch of the Bible in a very short time. What, what does any of this have to do with us? What can we take from it? Well, two things. The first thing, I think, has to do with Judah's perspective. And that's that when we are tempted to stand in harsh judgment over others, oh, look at them, they're doing this, they're doing this, they did this wrong, they they should have done it this way, it's usually something in us. Did you see how quick Judah was to, to, to throw Tamar under the bus? Oh, she's pregnant. Oh, crucify her! Never mind the fact that you're over here messing around with the cult. <laughs> you're over here, you know, you, you've left your brother over here. Your brothers and your father over here. You've gone off and done your own thing. You're intermarrying with non-believers. <laughs> Never mind all that. Kill Tamar. Kill her. And so you see, this is a great example of exactly what happens in us. We, we, we do something 
we are sinning or we're, we're doing something we shouldn't, we have an attitude that we shouldn't, and that we think that qualifies us to stand in such harsh judgment over somebody else. And uh, it makes us feel so good that we're over somebody else, that they're messing up and it's not us. Uh, but, you know, sin has a way of finding us out. It always does. It did for Judah and it will for us. Um, it's very easy to become like our culture. Very easy. You know, our culture preaches love, 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 but they're very unloving. It's very easy for us to do the exact same thing. Jesus warned us about this. The love of many will grow cold. Don't let your love grow cold. Their culture is acting evil. The culture doesn't, doesn't love unless you agree with them. The, the culture, the culture, that's fine. But we aren't supposed to be part of the culture. We're supposed to be separate from the culture. In the long run, it, it's really only going to hurt when we think that we're, you know, becoming like, when we, when we compromise our values and we uh, do things that we know aren't right, it's only going to hurt in the long run. It might seem like people are profiting from it, but they're not. The second thing that we can, that we can take away from this, this, this story here is that this is from Joseph's perspective. Don't just start doing the right thing. Keep doing the right thing. It doesn't matter if you're paid back for it. It doesn't matter if it pays off. It doesn't matter if people recognize you for all the stuff that you did. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It really doesn't. Keep doing the right thing. But Joseph wasn't able to say, but didn't you see all the stuff that I did? And we know that he wasn't in prison the whole time belly aching, because we see his character. We see his character. If he'd spent the whole time in prison whining, I can guarantee you he would have been a lot more bitter. Even if it doesn't pay off, do the right thing. You might not be rewarded, but it honors God when you suffer for doing what's right. Peter actually writes this. He says, if you do what's right and you suffer for it, that is for your best interest. This is good for you. And it's something that God desires from us. And uh, so that's really what we're called to as Christians. And you definitely see that in, in Joseph, constantly doing what's right. Lord, I pray that we'd be a light to our culture, uh, that we would shine even when we have reason not to shine, that even though we have ample opportunity to get our feelings hurt or to become bitter or to be, become self-focused or just uh, introvert on the, on the church itself instead of on, on, our, on the people out there, help us not to. It's really easy to become like that, but help us not to. Help us not to put you know, different viewpoints or different politics or different issues that we face in our world ahead of the gospel of peace, the gospel that really makes a difference in our lives, the same gospel that saved us through grace. Help us not to become like Judah, compromising on every step of the way, but help us to be like Joseph, suffering for doing nothing wrong. Lord, I pray you give us endurance when it isn't easy. Nobody needs a pep talk when they're when they're when times are going good. But help us to do what's right and to be a light when they're when it isn't easy. When when we have opportunity to be dark. Lord, I pray that we would stay separate from our culture. That we would show the love of Christ even to the greatest of sinners, just like you do to us. Help us not to put ourselves in such a high and lofty position above people in the culture that we that we wouldn't say stupid things like, "Well, they're they they sinned worse than I ever have." They're worse off than me. Help us not to get, become that self-righteous, prideful, arrogant person, Lord. Help us to stay humble and know exactly what we really are and how unworthy we are of your grace. That you would come for us. Lord, help us also to lay down our lives for the most wicked in the culture, not for those who earn it, since we didn't earn it. We love you, Lord. Amen.